Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Kyle Mox. I am the Director of National Scholarships at Arizona State University and Director of the Lorraine W. Frank Office of National Scholarships Advisement. And I'm also the Fulbright Program Advisor for Arizona State University. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Fulbright US Student Program um, and cover the program basics, application timeline, uh, hear from some alumni and some other experts and hopefully uh, have some time for Q&A and everyone leaves here today full of motivation and ready to apply. So that, that term national scholarships can be a little confusing and misleading for some people, um, but that term uh, means and the N and the, and the S and ANSA uh, refers to any sort of external uh, competitive merit-based uh, award of some type. So that is to say, all of the awards that we work with in my office um, and, and our entire staff are awards that come from outside of ASU and therefore are open to students from all over the United States uh, and sometimes increasingly all throughout the world. And so with that large pool, uh, we have a high level of comp competition and selection rates can be small because we're dealing with large numbers. And therefore, uh, because of the, the small selection rate, they are extremely prestigious, meaning that you can say, well, I was selected for this award. It only had a 5% selection rate. Um, the Fulbright has a very wide range of selection rates um, that varies quite a bit depending on country. Uh, and we can address that a little bit later because I know that's a question somebody's got already. It's like, oh, you know, how competitive is Fulbright? Uh, but it, it's the oldest and, and one of the largest um, fellowships in existence. And so it has a great deal of prestige just by name recognition alone. So uh, the Lorraine W. Frank Office of National Scholarships Advisement, we just refer to as ANSA to save ourselves uh, tongue cramps. Um, you know, we do what we're doing right now. We publicize these major awards uh, to the ASU community. We uh, provide information that is equitable and easily accessible and free to, to the ASU community. So current students, former students, graduate students, undergraduates, online students, on-campus students, all of our campuses, um, anyone can access our services. And so we're sending this information out. Sometimes it's broad, sometimes we're targeting, right? So many of you might've received an email from me on the basis of your academic performance or status or major or things like that, people that we think would be competitive for certain awards. Um, if there is a program like Fulbright that does have an endorsement requirement, we manage that process. And so we work and coordinate with um, faculty committees um, to, to put you all through a process to identify faculty members that would be good resources. Um, and then of course, the majority of our time, probably a good 80% of our time is sent simply advising candidates like yourselves. Uh, we're sitting down, talking through things, putting together workshops and other, other resources to help you write the best application you can write. Uh, but overall, what I would say is, you know, we are here not just to help people win awards, right? That's a pretty short-sighted goal to have. We are here to enhance your personal, professional, and academic development. Um, one way of doing that is to apply for national scholarships and fellowships, but that's not necessarily the outcome we're looking for. We are trying to accelerate you towards your specific goals. So uh, also joining us today are members of our staff, if we wanna say hello as I introduce them and wanted to include their, uh, some visuals here so you, you can, when you see them in real life, you actually recognize who they are. There's me, of course, you've already met me. Um, with regard to Fulbright, uh, my main area of responsibility is of course, I can talk to you about anything Fulbright, but once we get into the process, I generally deal with graduate students. I deal with people applying for study research awards and for people in creative and performing arts. Uh, also working on Fulbright uh, is Katie Salgado. Katie, you wanna say hello? Hi everyone, nice to see you all virtually. <laughs> Great, and Katie is our primary uh, ETA program advisor. So in all things ETA, you can work with her and she's an alumna of the program as well. She did her ETA in Portugal a few years ago. Uh, Dr. Laurie Stoff, one of our faculty mentors. Dr. Stoff, are you here today? I am. Wonderful. Hi everybody, great to see everyone on screen. Uh, looking forward to working with you further. Great. Uh, so our faculty mentors are Barrett faculty members who actually um, uh, give up some of their teaching load to come and help our applicants work for a variety of different awards. So uh, both Dr. Stoff and Dr. Bhattacharya, are you here as well? I am. Hello. Nice to see you all. Good. Uh, both of them uh, are eager to help you with in, any of the Fulbright uh, applications, um, ETA, study research, and both of them actually have certain area specialties as well. So Dr. Stoff works primarily uh, in Russian and Eastern European studies, and Dr. Bhattacharya works in, in, in South and, and Southeast Asian studies, broadly speaking. So, um, so anyway, uh, also with us today uh, is the rest of our staff. So uh, Shay Masterson, uh, Shay, are you here? 
Oh, that's right. She's visiting I, other. <laughs> yeah. I am here, but I am on the West Campus today. So I apologize, but it's good to be here and see everybody virtually. So uh, as she should be, she is our director for our program manager for outreach and inclusion. So she's out visiting one of the other campuses today, uh, not the Tempe campus. And so uh, she works for the wide range of undergraduate <laughs> awards. And uh, Kaya Johnson, Kaya, are you here today? I think I saw you. I am here. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. So uh, Kai is actually probably the most important person to get to know here because she is going to be your logistical support. So anything dealing with mechanics of the application, how does this work? How does that work? I've lost my transcripts. Uh, what are the deadlines? Uh, Kai is going to be your central processing unit for that. And our mystery guest, of course, will be uh, the new senior program manager that we're in the process of hiring uh, that has have we have not finished that process yet, but we're very excited about this because we're seeing increasing numbers of graduate students applying for all manner of awards, including Fulbright. And so we've actually uh, opened a position to actually specialize in graduate student advising. So this person, once they get on board, uh, I think probably in the next month or so, will be available to work specifically with graduate students who are probably coming into this a little bit differently. So anyway. That's introductions. Uh, and if we were in a room, we'd be all standing and, and kind of waving and saying hello. Um, I'll introduce you to our alumni guests in a bit. And also our special guest is coming up in just a moment as well. To give you some context, you know, and the first thing I always like to get out, out there, because a, a lot of people come into this, either they're familiar with Fulbright or this is the first time they've heard of it. And as soon as they start talking about competition and selection rates, they immediately start going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, this isn't for me. This sounds like not like something that ASU students do. Wrong. Okay, so Fulbright is among the top producing a uh, Fulbright recipient, Fulbright receiving a, a schools in the country. We have between 50 and 90 applicants per year. So we're one of the uh, largest applicant pools in the country. And we usually see between 15 and 30 applicants per year, which um, if you wanna look at this quantitatively over the past 10 years, we're easily in the top 15 schools in the country. Um, just to break this data down in a couple of interesting ways. The first thing you'll notice if you look at that list on the left, uh, what do all these schools have in common except for two, or, or actually three, I don't really call them Berkeley, but um, all of these schools are pretty well-known names, right? They're Ivy League schools, they're elite liberal arts in, uh, colleges and, and East Coast institutions for the most part. Um, there's only three public institutions even on this list, and ASU is second on this list. Michigan, of course, that, uh, is third overall there. That's a public university, sort of. Uh, Arizona State, of course, is a large public institution, and Berkeley is a public institution. The third column is the one I like to talk about, because if you notice, that's the undergraduate admission rate, right? So if we look at those numbers, not surprisingly, Harvard less than 5%, Chicago 6%, Yale 6%. We knew this, right? The U.S. News and World Report's constantly shoving it down our throat. Michigan, even as a public institution, is still pretty difficult to get into at 22%. Berkeley even more so. Every Californian wants to go to Berkeley, right? Um, and here's ASU with our charter uh, that, you know, we, we promised to not... Um, yeah, to, to include as many people as possible. We measure their success by how we help them succeed, right? So we're trying to do excellence to scale. And I love showing this sort of chart to President Crow to say, look, it's working, right? Um, so we have the students here that can succeed in this. So don't ever think that this is not the sort of thing that ASU students don't do. In fact, they do it, they do it very well. They do it on par with Ivy League institutions. Um, that's due in large part to a couple of factors. One, the incredible talent work of, of our staff. Two, the incredible talent and work of our students. And three, the incredible talent and work of our faculty. Uh, it's a community effort, really. And what I've enjoyed most in my, my seven years I've been at ASU is that the students are incredibly collaborative and supportive of one another. Um, and you'll find that out as you work through the process. We'll put you in writing groups together and they celebrate each other's success and the faculty are very enthusiastic about you all winning these awards. Um, and this is not something you do alone, right? This is something you do with lots of help. So. My favorite slide. That being said, and I've set the table quite well, um, I would like to introduce uh, Laura Siri, uh, a dear friend of mine and colleague uh, from the Institute for International Education. Laura, are you still here? I am, Kyle, thank you so much. I'm realizing that I've worn a blue sweater on a blue background, so not my best Zoom look, but um, <laughs> no, thank you so much for inviting me to get to be part of this kickoff day. I'm so happy to be here. Wonderful. We're so happy to have you. We'd love to have you in person, of course, so we can give you a tour of campus, but this will have to do. I will rain check that, I promise. 
Um, well, wonderful. Laura, is this going to cover some of the program basics for you in a, in a limited time and I'll release it. She's on East Coast time. So we are really digging into her, her extracurricular time here. So, Well, I wouldn't be here if ASU was not a priority for us. So I want to just start by saying what a um, tribute to the institution um, and to the Fulbright mission, Kyle and the whole office at ASU is. Um, we, You all have one of the best advisors in the business. I am okay saying that on a recorded webinar here. Um, and, and as Dr. Mox spoke about, this is really a collaborative effort. So I want to also thank the alums who are about to share their stories. I don't think there's any better advertisement for the program than to hear about folks who have participated, um, all of the faculty and staff who pitch in here. Um, this is meant to be an educational process. This is meant to be a process um, that really asks you to examine your life, your interests, um, your future trajectories, and to put those into one cohesive arch for us. Um, so you all are in incredible hands here. We're so happy to support all of the efforts at ASU um, and our excited to see even more applications as the as the cycles go on. Um, so if you'll allow me, I would love to talk a little bit about some of the program basics, just to make sure that you all are in the right place, that you get excited, that this feels like it's the right opportunity for, for you. Um, as has been mentioned, Fulbright is the flagship international exchange program that is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State. We are, have over 75 years of history of sending U.S. students and scholars overseas and also bringing foreign students and scholars to the U.S. So Fulbright is a binational program um, in its inception, in the way it has been administered for the last 75 years, um, and in the way that your applications will be, will be reviewed and looked at. We work with over 140 countries. So one of, I think the best, and it can, it can be a little bit daunting thing that's about Fulbright is that it's not one thing. It's not one award. It's not one type of award. It's not to one country. Um, so we hope that this means that there are genuine opportunities for you to participate in a way that does further your academic and personal trajectories in ways that are really authentic to you so that you can live and embody the mission of the program, which is to, to foster mutual understanding between nations. Um, Fulbright was created in the wake of World War II um, with the idea that if we knew each other a little bit better, if we had more person-to-person -person exchange, we could foster a more peaceful world. Um, I don't know if there's been a year that the program has been in existence where that hasn't been true and necessary, but certainly with uh, the events of recent, um, that, that continues to be true. So, um, so I do want to sort of speak a little bit today about some of our eligibility requirements, about what we're looking for. Um, but at the core of this program, it is an academic and cultural exchange program. We're interested in you taking your full curiosity with you overseas to do something that is going to impact your personal and academic trajectories long after the grant uh, ends. So Kyle has pull, graciously pulled up the what do you win slide here. Um, and it is important to note that Fulbright's are fully funded grant activities. So we're going to pay for your transportation to and from the host country. There's a living stipend that we'll provide to make sure that you have food, shelter, clothes, clothing, transportation, all those sorts of fun things. And then depending on the um, type of award and the country that you go to, there are other potential benefits that may factor in here. So there are some countries which do offer a small monetary stipend if you'd like to bring a dependent with you, so a, so a partner or a, or a child with you on the, on the grant experience. Um, some countries are able to offer language training while you're on grant. The primary aim of Fulbright is not language training as it is with some other international exchange programs, um, but we've learned in 75 years that turns out if you can talk to people, person-to-person -person exchange works a little bit better. So many countries do offer language training. Um, our researchers receive a research, a small research allowance, our English teaching assistants receive a small stipend to help with classroom supplies, books, pencils, all those types of things that teachers are responsible for in the US and other places, it, it turns out. And then Fulbright is really meant to be a wraparound grant experience. So there are going to be enrichment activities throughout your award, um, starting with an orientation, either here in the US before you leave, um, or once you arrive in country. There are mid-year seminars, opportunities throughout your grant experience to get to know other Fulbrighters. And then we have just actually started offering re-entry resources. So ways to help you transition from your Fulbright grant into the workforce or academia, whatever it is that, you're, that, that comes next. Um, some of the ways that Fulbright does sort of continue to hopefully enhance your personal and academic trajectory um, outside of your grant year experience is really um, making sure that you are part of the Fulbright alumni community, some of whom you'll hear from today. Um, 
very often when Fulbrighters talk about what was entailed with their grant, they don't talk about the transactional benefits. They don't talk about the health, accident and sickness benefits. They don't talk about the flights. What they talk about is joining a community of over 400,000 alumni, um, both US students and scholars and foreign students and scholars, um, folks who are interested and have an international lens to their work. And that is a reward that pays dividends all throughout a life cycle. Um, so I do want to say very tangibly that all Fulbright winners do receive non-competitive hiring eligibility with the federal government um, in the year after their award. So if you are interested in federal service, um, please know that this will give you a leg up in, in employment. Um, I missed something on the benefit slides. We don't need to go back, but I just want to hit out, touch on it very uh, very uh, quickly to say that as a federally funded program, right, as a funded a program that is funded by an annual appropriation from the US Congress, diversity and making sure that we are sending abroad a cohort of students who represent all aspects of American society is very important to us. Um, and that includes applicants with disabilities, visible or otherwise. Um, so we do have disability related accommodations that can be provided while you are on your grant to make sure that that experience experience is, is attainable and accessible to all of our applicants. So um, a little bit of a preview about what you're going to see. And when we talk about the depth and breadth of Fulbright, what we mean here. Um, so Fulbright offers over 2000 awards annually, going to over 140 countries. So when we talk about what makes a successful applicant, or that's going to vary uh, depending on the award that you've selected and the country that you're going to. If it's helpful to break it down, our award categories fall into two major buckets. The first is our academic bucket. These are our study and research awards. And then we have our English teaching assistantships. Um, so Kyle, if you don't mind, I'll spend a minute talking about these two and, and then we can see if there are, are any questions that I can help uh, clear up before I go. Um, our academic awards fall into major into, into two overarching categories. The first are our research awards. So this is where you are proposing to go overseas. You pick the country that you're going to. You identify where in the country you need to be to conduct your research. You select um, and find an affiliation in that country. And we'll talk way more about that later, later on, I promise. Um, but you identify where in the country you need to go to conduct your research. And your application is laying out for us your academic question, your methodologies, your timeline, and really making a case for why your work would benefit from spending a year overseas. For those of you who don't feel like you're quite at the level of wanting to do an independent research project, we also offer graduate degree programs. So more and more countries are offering the opportunity to go over and have your Fulbright grant activity to be to enroll in a master's or sometimes PhD program overseas. So there are, again, lots of variations depending on the country about the way that this works. A lot of the programs are one-year masters, although we do have more and more countries that are offering multiple years of funding. So again, there's not a one-size-fits-all and part of your discernment process and what part of what the office is here to help you do is pick the right award for you as you move through the process. The other more than half of the awards that we offer are the English Teaching Assistantship Awards. Um, and we're going to announce tomorrow that we are going to be offering the English Teaching Assistantship Program in 80 countries this year. We're very excited about that. Um, the English Teaching Assistantship Program is designed to put young dynamic Americans into classrooms overseas to help students with their language ability. Um, the placement location, both in terms of the age group of the student that you're gonna be working with and also where in country you're going to be placed varies depending on the country that you go to. So if you know that you're someone who's very interested in early childhood, you're gonna, not gonna to wanna to go to a country that places their ETAs at a college or university. Um, so again, lots of factors to consider here um, when you're making your selection about what type of award and also what country. An important thing to note about the ETA program um, very quickly is that one of the tenets of this program is that you pick the country that you're applying to, but then we take care of all of the arrangements about what school you'll be going to in that country. So unlike our academic awards where you have to identify who your affiliate is or which graduate program you're going to, as the ETA, you have a little bit less work on the front end of the application since you don't have to pick the location in the country, you just have to pick the country that you're going to. You do have to show more flexibility if you receive the award because we place you and you have to go where you're, where you're placed. Um, 
Very quickly, I will say that you don't have to be an education major, nor do you have to plan to go into education long term to be competitive with this program. We have people who go on to medical school and law school, private and public sector careers, um, but really making the case about your qualifications and how this ties into your future plans is what's going to make a successful ETA applicant. Wonderful. Well, Laura, thank you so much. And we're going to unpack some of what you know Laura's introduced here in, in the upcoming slides. And so, Laura, if you'd like to get on with your life, you're more than welcome to. If you want to stick around and, and hear from our alumni uh, and their testimonials, you're more than welcome to hang out. I, I certainly welcome it. But thank you well, so much for joining thank us you for Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. So I did see a couple of uh, questions popping up in the chat. Uh, we'll be handling those as they arise, uh, but we'll certainly be coming back to them uh, at the end in Q&A because I'm sure they're going to be of interest to everybody. But some of them might be answered here in, in the upcoming slides. So uh, in terms of special awards, there are also subordinate types of awards within the study research um, that you know, could be focused on specific fields. Generally speaking, the academic or, or you know, the study research awards are, are open to it, just about anything you can propose. I call them a choose your own adventure. You can pick whatever you want to do. Uh, but there are awards specifically for creative and performing arts in certain countries. There are awards specifically for graduate degree awards. And one of the questions I did see in the chat was, well, most master's programs are 18 months, two years. In the US, they are. Um, one year master's degrees are more common abroad. So um, many of your master's programs in, in, uh, in Europe or the UK um, uh, can be completed within the bounds. If they cannot, you know that, that might change things in terms of your Fulbright application. And that's a case by case conversation. There are some awards specifically tied to journalism. We're gonna hear about that from uh, one of our alumni uh, here in a moment. Uh, even some specific STEM awards and some larger awards in public health. And one of the awards eventually all of you find is the Nat Geo or the National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellowship, which sounds really cool and exciting uh, because you get mentored by people from Nat Geo and you get to publish your you know, uh, pictures and whatnot on their blog. Um, it's very, very competitive because it is very cool. All right. Um, so my take home message to you here is be sure you review the country summaries. I would really start by looking at countries and not necessarily types of awards to see if they offer anything interesting. Um, but again, we have a lot of resources to help you think through the different types of awards. Um, so as Laura indicated, the, you know, the Fulbright is open to people who will have a bachelor's degree by the time your award starts. So what we are talking about right now are awards that would start in the fall of 2023. Is that, is that right? Um, so that would mean that you would need to graduate by August 2023. So uh, our current rising seniors, so people that are currently in their third year that plan to graduate next year, uh, people that are graduating this year, anyone who's graduated at all has a bachelor's degree, perfectly fine. And graduate students, of course, because they have a bachelor's degree. Even though they're currently in school in another degree, they do have a bachelor's degree and are therefore eligible to go. Um, you must be a U.S. citizen at the time of application because this is a federally funded program um, and um, you cannot have received a Ph.D. at the time of application. So once you've received a Ph.D., you click over to a different type of award called the Fulbright Scholar Award. And, and sometimes our applicants end up on that website. So let's just be sure that you're always looking at the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. So um, we've covered the basics, basic type of grants. We'll unpack that a bit more. But, you know, how do you win one? right? What are they looking for? Is my GPA good enough? Do I have the right major? I'll just start by saying that there's no minimum GPA for Fulbright, and I don't know what the average is. Fulbright doesn't track it. I don't track it. I couldn't tell you um, because it's not one of the primary factors in selection. The first and foremost factor in selection is the quality and feasibility of the proposal, and that's great because that is something that you can control. You can control the quality of the written statement. Um, that's something that hard work can produce good results. And in terms of feasibility, we'll talk more about that in a second, but how realistic is this plan uh, in the eyes of the National Screening Committee? Uh, your academic and professional record matters, of course. They are going to look at your transcripts to see is, okay, is there a yo-yo pattern here or was there a bad first term? Uh, do they have the right courses to do what they're proposing to do? You know, if you want to go to the London School of Economics, but you've got a, a 3.0, that's probably not very feasible, right? Uh, but also your, your other achievements uh, that have happened, awards, honors, things like that. Uh, personal qualifications, a little vague. We'll, we'll unpack that a bit more in a second. Um, many countries are going to require that you speak the language in that country. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to people, but English is not spoken everywhere. Um, 
it varies. It varies by country. Uh, many countries, many uh, well-developed countries, particularly in, in Western and Northern Europe, have a high proportion of English speakers. Other countries with, um, that are closer to the middle and the, and the global south, maybe not as much. But it also depends on what you want to do for your project. Uh, if your project involves a high level of communication with people in rural areas or maybe people outside of the major cities, um, you would need to speak the language of that host country. And also it facilitates cultural exchange if you can actually communicate in that same language. It's difficult, I think. Um, and that level of proficiency varies by country. So again, once you look at that country summary to know, okay, if I'm going to go to South America across the board, I'm going to need intermediate Spanish. doesn't matter what country in South America, they're all intermediate Spanish. Uh, the other part of the overall picture is, does, you, does your project and do you as a person help advance the Fulbright mission? Um, either you know, explicitly, you know, my project is focused on studying cultural exchange and you know, international relations, what have you, or do you as a person, because you are um, outgoing enough, because you demonstrate leadership characteristics, because you're a good uh, ambassador for the US, are you promoting the Fulbright mission? And then the overall uh, desirability for uh, diversity. And I would, I would actually change that a little bit to call representation. And, and the way that I look at it is, are we sending abroad to the rest of the world a cohort of, of recipients that actually resembles the population of this country? You know, not everyone uh, in the United States is an East Coast well-to-do white male, right? Uh, and in a lot of cases, that's who gets to have these privileges. But in reality, you and, and I, and we all know, uh, that's not what this country looks like. There's a wide range of people that live in this country, a wide range of ages and experiences and socioeconomic um, stories to tell. And so Fulbright, all things being equal, is very interested in making sure that the rest of the world understands how diverse the United States really is. So I promised to unpack personal qualifications because that's about as vague as a, a criterion as you can get. But um, as we sat back and we think about it, okay, what marks a really good Fulbright app? What, what are the qualities that we see? Excellent communication skills, obviously, you know, because you've got to write this really clear application and you're going to be spending 10 months abroad in another country, uh, hopefully being a good ambassador. And so you've got to have good communication skills. Um, and even if your project doesn't have anything to do necessarily with language or communication, you've got to be somebody that can uh, uh, integrate into a community. You're going to be spending uh, basically an academic year abroad in another country more than a year from now. Things are going to change. So you, you do need to demonstrate that you are a flexible, adaptable person. Uh, you're open to adventure, that you're open to things not necessarily going um, not necessarily going as planned. Yes, we are going to write a very clear plan. Is it going to follow that plan? Almost 100% certainly not. Um, so are there, is there evidence that you can provide that you have been flexible or adaptable in the past? And leadership ability, meaning are you the sort of person that's eager to jump in and help when there's a problem? Are you the sort of person that tries to bring out the best in other people? Uh, do you have a clear idea where you're trying to go with yourself and therefore want to help other people do it as well? Uh, it's not necessarily the person who does all the work, right? That's, a little, that's management. That's not necessarily leadership. And we see that demonstrated quite commonly as service. So they're looking for evidence that you're going to be involved in your host country community. And so we look at your previous behavior to see, have you been involved in your community here? And so sometimes we get applicants who say, yeah, this sounds really great. And then we look at the resume and like, so what have you done the last four years? Like, well, I've been to school and I go to work and we, they're going to need more evidence, right? To, to be able to predict whether or not you're going to be successful at promoting the Fulbright mission. And so it's really helpful if you have a pretty clear extracurricular interest or uh, concepts for enrichment activities. So hobbies, uh, athletics, music, art, uh, specific academic interests. Athletes are great, right? Because what are you going to do for community engagement? Like I'm going to start a I'm going to start a volleyball club at my school because I played volleyball at ASU. Wonderful. You know, I'm going to start an after school art program because I'm a visual arts minor. These sorts of really concrete ideas for how do we engage outside of the main project are really important. And we can help you unpack that as well. So and again, uh, they do want to see how do you represent the diversity, whether it's, it's something obvious or something less obvious. In terms of what goes into the application, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there are the basic you know, biographical parts of the application that would be familiar to any of you who have attended college. Uh, but the main part of the, of the application, the part that we spend all the time working on are really the essays. Um, for um, all the Fulbright applications, you have a statement of grant purpose and you have a personal statement. So the statement of grant purpose in the case of the study research application is two pages. And in that two pages, you'll explain the entire uh, nine, 10 months that you'll be in that country. 
uh, what your timeline is, what your objectives are, research methodologies, partners that you've already identified, expected outcomes, things like that. Um, in the case of the ETA, because as, as Laura explained, you don't necessarily need to identify your partners. You don't need to pick a location. They'll do that for you. You only need one page to cover uh, what your expectations are for the year. Uh, it's actually fairly difficult to do all that one page. And then in both cases, you're going to write a one page personal statement that will help the, the readers understand how you fit all of those desired characteristics and tell your story about why you want to do this at all. In both types of applications, you're also going to need three references. And in the case of the study research, that would be three letters of reference, traditional academic letters of reference. Um, they don't necessarily need to be uh, faculty. Uh, they can be people that have supervised you in, in work or volunteer positions or people that have, have worked with you in other capacities, but they do need to be of sufficient credibility. Um, and it also really depends on the nature of your project, right? If you're proposing a graduate degree award, we'd want to see some academic references. For the ETAs, you would get evaluation forms. And these would be ideally people that can have witnessed you um, doing the sorts of things that an English teacher would be doing. You know, are you good at working with other people? Are you, would you be good at managing a classroom? Do you seem to have any knowledge of this host country? And in some cases, um, you'll, you'll need a foreign language evaluation to show that, yeah, I speak Italian, like, do you really? And so we're gonna have a faculty member uh, at ASU evaluate that language ability and you'll upload that to the application. Uh, for study research applicants, um, in many cases, you're going to need to produce a letter of affiliation, which means you have reached out to somebody in that host country, um, pitched your idea, and they said, yeah, that sounds great. I would love to be your host. And then they'll provide that letter for your application. And then finally, uh, for uh, creative and performing arts applicants, you would need to show that you can actually do that art. And so you'll have to produce a portfolio uh, that could be video. It, can, it really depends on the art form that we're talking about. Uh, one of our alumni here today uh, is, was a creative performing arts applicant. He can perhaps talk a little bit about that. So in terms of timeline, uh, we are at the very widest end of the funnel. The application for the next cycle opens tomorrow, which is very exciting. Um, so that's the soonest that you can open an application and get started. Uh, and so throughout the, between now and, and all through August, you'll be working on your projects, working on your proposals, um, nailing down affiliations, thinking through all the different parts of the application, making sure you've got your uh, references and recommendations straightened out. Um, our application deadline at ASU is September 13. So that is the point at which you will need to submit to us a complete application. It is not in its final form. We're still about a month away from the final deadline, but it's a dress rehearsal. If we had to go with this one, we could. So that's your timeline to be thinking about. In September, we'll do campus evaluations. So, so you'll get to meet uh, our faculty who are eager to help you. Um, they'll interview you and give you some feedback on your application. And you'll have some time to finalize that application uh, for the national deadline, which is, I, I believe, going to be October 11 this year. Now, after that, we wait. Um, I like to tell applicants it's best to just forget you ever did this and go on with your life as if this never happened, right? Which is easy for many applicants to do. Um, and by the end of January, you'll find out if your application has been referred by the American uh, Reading Committee to the, the committee in your host country. To me, one of the coolest things about Fulbright is that the final selection of, of winners is made by committees in the host countries themselves. So they are deciding whether or not they want to invite you into the country, which is important to think about as you're thinking about your approach and your audience. You know, you want to ta be talking to the people of that country, uh, not at them, right? So. Uh, this time of year is an exciting time for us because we're hitting refresh uh, on our browsers and on our email uh, clients all the time because we're getting announcements at this point almost on a daily basis. So this year we had, I think, 36 students who were referred to their host country or considered semi-finalists, and we're waiting to hear if they've been awarded. So we are off to a great start, and we hope to have a lot of great news to share with you all soon, uh, but very exciting. So you can see it's almost a year-long process. Right. And so uh, from start to finish, if you were to start tomorrow, you might have actually started um, about the time that you'll find out next year. So patience is a virtue. Um, it is submitted completely online. And once you open an application, we can see it on our side. So we actually control that process. We have administrative access. So don't need to worry that you'll screw something up. We can, we can handle that. Uh, you will also upload the liberal affiliation if you if you need to obtain one of those. And uh, once you identify people writing your references, they will upload separately. So you will sign a non-disclosure and so you won't you know, be able to see those references and they'll upload them and they'll be private. And then you upload your own transcripts as well. 
So um, they have to be, you can't necessarily apply on your own. So if you are currently enrolled at ASU and you'll be enrolled at the time of application, the expectation is that you apply through us. Uh, if an application goes to the national committee and they see that you're currently enrolled at ASU, but you didn't get endorsed by us, that would be a red flag for them. They would wonder why not, right? And I would wonder why not too, because we have a lot of resources to help you apply. If you are not currently enrolled, if you're an alumnus, you can apply at large. There's nothing stopping you, but I would certainly encourage you to apply through us because if you do, then you have access to all the resources that we provide. Uh, so you, you can apply in either category if you like, but we certainly encourage you to apply through our campus process. So those campus interviews, that seems to be the strongest deterrent for most people because I think most of us have been traumatized by interviews at some point. Uh, these are very friendly interviews for the most part. Um, if you do your job and write a quality application, which you should if you get started now, um, they'll be happy to see you, uh, they'll be happy to talk to you, and they'll be happy to write a strong evaluation for you because you are an ASU student, they are ASU faculty, and they want you to succeed. And then we'll submit those finalized applications uh, in the first week or two of October. So how do we do this? Uh, we have a designated website, fulbright.asu.edu. That is our ASU-specific Fulbright guidance page. And there are a number of short videos that do kind of recover and talk about the basics that we've just talked about today. Um, you want to start reviewing award types and country summaries just to familiarize yourself with them. Once you go to the us.fulbrightonline.org site, you will see it's very big. It's a very big app, you know, website, and it's not the sort of website that you're going to consume all in one sitting. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like as Laura said, there's 140 countries, there's multiple grant types. So give yourself some time. Um, once you start having a shorter list, like, okay, I've narrowed it down to 10 countries. Um, good time to start working through things. One of the great ways to get started is to enroll in our Fulbright boot camp series. So we have one boot camp series starting Friday, uh, April 1st, and those are three week sessions. So we'll meet once a week at noon on Fridays uh, for three weeks, and we'll work through a lot of these questions together. Um, and so we also have one that's going to be Tuesday. So starting this coming Tuesday for three weeks at noon, uh, sort of a brown bag session. If you cannot attend the, the boot camps, that's fine. We can cover the same information and answer the same questions in other ways. It's just a very effective and efficient way for a lot of us to get started together at once. Um, to formally get started and placed into our Canvas, you'll need to meet with one of the Fulbright program advisors. So myself, uh, Katie, Dr. Stoffer, Dr. Bhattacharya. Um, and once we see that you've opened an application, we'll place you uh, into our Canvas page and you'll have access to uh, hordes of resources. So as I mentioned, as you're starting to daydream and as you're starting to fantasize about this project that you're going to do, if you want to go to the study research group, the first thing you need to think about is feasibility. Um, that there's a logic to why you've chosen this country. There's a logic to why you chose this location in the country. Um, that I'm really into its culture and history is not a compelling reason, right? The reason why you're going to this country has to be better than the reason you've gone anywhere else or stayed in the United States. So that's one of the things we're going to question you on as we get started. Um, you'll need to be very concrete and specific about um, you know, what you're doing at what point throughout the entire year. The committee needs to know how you're spending this money. You know, what happens first, what happens next, how long are you spending on the different phases of that. Uh, that's the part that generally takes the longest to work on. And so we're here to help you work through that as well. A study research proposal can also include academic study. Uh, we did mention that there are awards specifically for graduate degrees where you would matriculate and actually enroll in a graduate program. But many Fulbrighters throughout the years simply affiliate with the university and they audit some classes or they sit in on some classes or they have a faculty member that they're affiliated with and they research and they read and they write and they attend some classes, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a degree producing study, uh, but it does need to include community engagement, whether that's uh, as part of your project or secondary to your project that in addition to my, you know, outside of the bounds of my project, I will also do the following, right? Um, and that's something we're going to be sure that you include as well. And we need to know that this is leading you somewhere, right? The National Screening Committee wants to know that this is going to benefit you and is going to help propel you towards your career aim. So this is not necessarily just a gap year filler, right? This has got to be something that's a bridge. It's getting you from this side to that side. And it's very clear that this year abroad is actually going to help you achieve the goals that you've articulated in this application. So if you don't know what your goals are, then that's something else we need to put on the checklist, right? We need to figure out uh, how, what all this is for. 
And we talk about feasibility. We're thinking about how much time are you spending on different parts of it? Do you have the resources available? Do you have the language skills? Do you yourself have the academic preparation to execute this sort of thing? Um, you know, graduate students often are using study research to do dissertation research, and that's a very common thing to do. So, um, you know, that's one thing to consider. Creative and performing arts applicants uh, are there to study under a master performer or artist. Um, they're evaluated the same way that the study research proposals are, but they also have a secondary committee who are artists or performers in that particular field. So in addition to say um, the, the French committee, uh, if you're applying for organ, then there would also be an organ specific committee that determines whether or not you're any good at this, right? Uh, because not everyone can evaluate um, art artists. And there has to be a good reason. Again, just like anything else, that there's, there's a very good reason why you've gone to this country to study under this artist. You couldn't have done it at home. If you're interested in the graduate degree option, um, most countries these days, increasing numbers of countries are allowing formal study at universities within their, within, uh, their borders. Um, there are many countries that have awards specifically for graduate study. So as you're looking at your countries, you'll see that there's open study research and then they'll have an award specifically say for Ghent or for the London School of Economics or other specific universities. And in most cases, that's a one-year master's program. Uh, if your program that you want to do is longer than a year, and unless the, the Fulbright program description says otherwise, you'll get funding for one year and then you would have to do the further years on your own. Some of the Fulbright graduate degree awards will actually cover full cost. And so again, you gotta read the country summaries. It really varies because each of the countries sets their own rules, which again, is, is kind of cool. This is a multilateral program. Uh, it may include tuition and fees. And in some cases it may not. Um, the good news is, is outside of the US tuition is, is relatively cheap. Only in the US do we charge um, roughly the, part, the price of a nice house to get educated, but. Um, and it may be in English, particularly if, if you're in Western or Northern Europe. Um, outside of Europe, you might be, you know, be taking courses in the language of the host country. So you would need to have proficiency uh, at that academic professional level. Um, and if you're going to go this route, in almost all cases, you do need to apply for admission. And that would occur after you submit your Fulbright application in October. Um, and so you know, it's quite possible then that you would be admitted to that university, but not receive Fulbright funding. The reverse, however, would never be true. You would get a Fulbright, but get denied by the, by the university. If you are doing a study research proposal and need letters of affiliation, uh, that would be a contact in that country uh, who is going to mentor you. Uh, in most cases, it's an academic professional, uh, a scholar or a researcher at a university, but it can be somebody at an NGO or a nonprofit organization. Uh, it really just depends on the nature of your project. It needs to make sense. Um, those specific requirements will vary by country as well, and that's something you're going to keep hearing. You know, Every question you ask is probably going to start with, well, that depends. Um, and, and, but it is an actual signed letter on letterhead and that you'll upload to the application. If you're an English teaching assistant applicant, you don't need to worry about affiliations, right? They'll take care of all that for you. So those of you that are thinking about ETA, you know, what, what is it they're looking for exactly? As Laura pointed out at the outset, they're not necessarily looking for people with TESOL certifications or who are English majors uh, or who are planning to become teachers, right? All of that is certainly advantageous. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily on the list of, of, of things that they're looking for. Some countries are, some countries are looking for people with pretty high level um, uh, training. But uh, the first and foremost thing is enthusiasm, right? This has got to be somebody that we are confident would excel in a foreign classroom teaching whatever age range that they're working on. And so you know, the picture in the background here, she's obviously very enthusiastic. She's happy to be working uh, with students uh, at this age and they can have different talents and skills and abilities they can bring to the table. So your job um, as you work on the application, think, okay, how do I translate what it is I do as a student now into what I would do as a teacher then? And I may not be an English major. You know, we've had engineering majors win ETAs. We've had um, business majors win ETAs. Uh, but as you work through it, you also need to demonstrate you've got some knowledge and awareness of the host country culture. You know, the, the methods of teaching that we use in the US may not work as well in other countries. And so you need to do your research and you have to present a sound explanation for why you've chosen this country. You know, if you just kind of spin the dial and, and, and pick a country that pops up or you throw a dart at the map, that's going to be a tough application, right? We will work with you to figure out, okay, what is that connection between me and this country? And just to spoil it for you, heritage connection is not a valid explanation. 99% of Americans have a heritage connection to another country outside of the United States. 
Um, but you want to be also talking about what you're going to do outside of the classroom, meaning how do I engage with my host country? Uh, because my teaching assignment could very well just be 20, 25 hours a week. So how do I account for the rest of that time? And once again, making an explanation for why an ETA experience would be useful to your future career. And again, not everyone's going to be an English teacher. Many of you say would want to be in the foreign service or work for the Department of State. Absolutely, this is a great experience. Somebody who wants to be uh, working in international law. Absolutely. Uh, other people just know that they're going to go on to get a PhD and work in this country later on down the road. Absolutely. All valid explanations. References as well. I know it's very early, but it's never too early to start thinking about these. Um, they are due by the campus deadline. So keep that in your mind that as you're approaching people, it is due by September 13. Um, they need to summarize your ability to serve as a cultural ambassador, as a student. Basically, they're making the argument that you can succeed at whatever it is you're proposing to do. Um, you want to talk to them four to six weeks in advance, but if you look at the calendar, you realize that that's probably during the summer. And a lot of faculty are hard to get a hold of in the summer uh, because they've earned it, right? So now in the spring, before we leave for the term, is a really wonderful time to just make that approach, right? To say, hey, you know, uh, Dr. Smith, I'm going to be applying for Fulbright uh, later on, and I was just wondering if you'd be willing to serve as one of my references. Great. I'll follow up with you later this summer with more details. And we actually do have a memorandum guidance that you can give to them uh, that explains the context better. And, and most faculty really know Fulbright quite well, um, but that tells them exactly what the audience is looking for and helps them write a stronger letter for you. And you can access that once you get into our Canvas. So I've mentioned the Canvas a couple of times. Uh, it's very large. It actually exists outside of the general ONSA Canvas because it's so big. And it literally will walk you through the process from start to finish. Um, it's got examples in there. It's got uh, tips and tricks for how to do different parts of the application. It's got some recorded seminars and things like that. Um, as we progress through the process, we'll uh, organize some writing workshops, uh, both group and individual and sort of peer advising workshops, but we'll be doing a lot of writing feedback back and forth as you're working with myself or, or Katie or Dr. Stoffer, Dr. Bhattacharya, um, as you continue to draft and revise these application materials. And we're here to answer any questions. So don't ever think like, oh, I don't know this. I just might not be smart enough. If, if I don't know the answer to this, I don't deserve to be a full right. It's a very large, complex, um, often kind of abstract process, right? And so don't be afraid to, if you just need help, reach out to Kai or myself or anyone else um, on the team. And I'd mentioned the Fulbright boot camps. Um, if that sounds like what you're in for and you want to get started as early as this Friday, by all means, you can go to the same place where you registered for this session and register for one of those boot camps. Um, if you can't make the boot camps, no problem. You know, we'll, we'll see you in advising. Um, we also have uh, in, the, in the summer an applicant development program, and this is a more intensive six week developmental workshop. Um, it is limited in the number of enrollees that we can include in it because it is so labor intensive, uh, but this is be a great option for anyone that is looking at postgraduate fellowships in general. So really looking at um, you know, rising seniors, graduating seniors, recent graduates who are looking at a wide range of postgraduate fellowships, including Fulbright, but maybe in addition to Fulbright as well. Um, so you do need to apply for that one, and uh, you'd have to be approved before you're included. It's non-credit bearing, so there's no fee or anything like that, and it's about six weeks, roughly aligns with session A. All right, enough of the boring part. Um, I, we, I'm very uh, happy to have a number of alumni here that um, are eager to share their experiences with you, um, that, uh, of their time as a Fulbrighter. Um, and so we're just going to bring them up in roughly alphabetical order. And you know, as we're going through and you're thinking about questions that you have specifically for them, save them up because we're trying to save enough time uh, for Q&A here. So, so first, I'd like to invite uh, Hayden up to talk about uh, her time in Australia. Hello, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Awesome. OK. Yeah, so I'm actually still in Australia currently. Um, so for those of you asking more about a master's program, I'd be happy to talk to any of you about that. Um, but I was a 2019, 2020 applicant for Fulbright um, at ASU and um, Kyle Mox helped me greatly with my application and everything. Um, and I applied to a master's program at the University of Sydney in Sydney, Australia. Um, and I came here in 2021 and I'll be here for two years. So I'm about halfway through my Fulbright program. Um, just speaking a little bit about my time here. Um, 
when Kyle Mox and everyone else was talking about the need for applicants to be good communicators and adaptable. That is definitely true given um, the recent circumstances with COVID and everything else. Um, I have come here and had an excellent time so far, but um, due to COVID, things have been up in the air a lot of times with my research. Um, and I've had to experience a lot of the lockdown laws in Australia, which has been an interesting experience. Um, but I have had an excellent time overall participating in the cultural exchange here and working with my supervisor um, on the research that I came here to do. Um, so I shared a few of the pictures here. Hopefully people can see them all right um, here on the left-hand side. Um, I've had a chance to meet other Fulbrighters that are um, Australian and will be embarking on their Fulbright journey to the US um, this upcoming year. So we all met up for a dinner at the Sydney Opera House, which was um, a really cool experience. I've met a lot of other international students during my time here and explored um, a bit of the country. Um, um, some other cultural exchange experiences I've had of it have included going to things like rugby games and other quintessentially Australian sports like cricket. Um, I've gone camping with my friends to the beaches and of course a massive part of my time here has been um, doing my actual research project um, and uh, working on uh, the science that I came here to do. Um, yep, so that's just a bit about me and my time here. And I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. Oh, sorry, Kyle, I think you're on mute still. Sorry, I never, I almost never do that. Uh, I was just wondering <laughs> in a sentence or two, if you could explain what your research is in Australia. Yeah, of course. So um, my master's is in um, neuroimmunology and the project I came here to do is uh, looking at two neuroimmune factors and how they um, contribute to diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. So I'm working on a novel drug inhibitor um, in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. Great. Excuse yeah. me. So Hayden was actually part of a um, uh, special award that was new called the Fulbright Futures <laughs> Award. So that's unique to Australia and it does a longer than one year award. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. Well, um, I do see some hands up, but we're going to try to save those for Q&A because I want to be sure that everyone gets an opportunity to, to share their experiences. So, uh, Carolina, are, are you here with us? I am. Hi. Good to see everybody. Um, I will try to be as brief as I can. Uh, I had a really wonderful time. Um, during my Fulbright experience, which unfortunately, because of COVID, was also cut a little bit short. Um, but given the opportunity, I would absolutely do it all over again. Um, so I'll start off maybe by talking a little bit about um, myself, um, what motivated me to apply to Fulbright, um, and then uh, some advice that I, I might have uh, for some future applicants, if that sounds okay to you. Great. Um, so I am currently a program and development associate um, in the DC area at a small NGO. I graduated from Barrett in 2019. Um, I went to Portugal as an English teaching assistant uh, immediately after graduating. And in part, I applied because I was a little bit unsure about what I wanted to do after college. Um, I had multiple majors and minors. My background was very mixed. Um, and I knew that I probably wanted to do something um, after graduating that had an international dimension, that had an educational dimension, but I wasn't totally certain. And I really thought that uh, the Fulbright program would be a really wonderful opportunity for me to kind of explore um, different interests, different skills, um, and uh, make connections uh, locally with um, a country that I'd always wanted to visit. Um, my family is also originally from Brazil, so I, I had a Portuguese language background, um, and this was a really great opportunity for me to continue practicing, uh, you know, try and uh, improve my accent, um, you know, for the, the sake of my, my mom and dad. Um, and so I, I had a really wonderful experience while I was there. I was placed um, in Ladia, which is a small town about an hour and a half north of Lisbon, which is one of the things that I really liked um, about working with the Fulbright Commission in Portugal. There are kind of a range of possible placements for ETAs. Um, a lot of students might be placed in major cities like Lisbon or Porto, but a lot of them are also placed in smaller interior towns. Um, one of the grantees was placed in the Azores. I was so jealous of her. She was like on the beach every day, um, you know, for months on end. Um, and it was really kind of a wonderful experience to get to know this more quaint, um, you know, historic town. 
as opposed to, you know, the kind of bigger, uh, you know, flashier urban areas that you often see people posting about on Instagram during their vacations. Um, it was a really wonderful kind of opportunity to just, um, you know, see people's day to day and really get to know, um, you know, the stories of, of people that, you know, in, in growing up in, in Arizona, I, I might not have, um, you know, met otherwise. Um, I also really learned that I loved teaching. Um, I had several kind of missteps along the way, but I developed very fond relationships with my students, um, which included local Portuguese undergraduates, as well as several international students on exchange, which was um, a really fun and immersive experience. Um, you know, a moment that I remember really fondly was asking my students for feedback on my teaching midway through the year. And they wrote these really adorable notes saying, oh, you know, we really like Professor Mark, who was my supervisor, but we would prefer for Carolina to remain our, our teacher for the rest of the year because we like working with her so much. So uh, that was a, a really kind of fun memory that I have um, of, of my time there. And aside from being in Portugal itself, um, you know, one thing that I would love to talk about as well is all of the travel that I did internally that year in Portugal and all around Europe. Um, one of the great things about doing Fulbright is that depending on the commission, um, there might be opportunities to attend events or seminars with other Fulbrighters in different parts of the region where you're located, um, which is exactly what I did. So in, in early February, I received a grant from the commission to travel to Luxembourg and Brussels for a seminar on EU, NATO, and the European Court of Justice. And so we visited the headquarters and met with top officials in each of these institutions. And so for someone with my background in international relations, this is a really phenomenal um, and unique experience. Um, I met a lot of amazing people. This slide is kind of interesting because uh, those of us that were at the seminar did a hot yoga class. Uh, it was like, you know, blisteringly cold in Brussels in the beginning of February. And Erica Lutz, who is the I believe she's the director of the commission in Belgium. She's also a yoga instructor. She took us to her hot yoga class. Um, I almost fainted, but I don't typically talk about that. Um, and in fact, one of my best friends in DC at the moment is actually a person that I met at this seminar. And so Fulbright can also be a really great opportunity to meet um, you know, people that you have long-term friendships and relationships with because you're all kind of going through um, similar things. Um, so to finish off, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm happy to respond to any questions later on, um, two pieces of advice that I have uh, for future Fulbrighters. Um, one, as uh, Dr. Mock said, if you want a Fulbright grant and don't already speak the local language, I highly encourage you to learn. Um, even if it's not required, it's a big ask, but especially if you're applying to an ETA grant, this is a great way to kind of put yourself in your students' shoes and understand the challenges that they're facing as learners of English. Um, people locally will also trust you so much more if you learn to communicate in the local language or at least try. Um, and this will really help you immerse yourself in your host country. And my second piece of advice is that, of course, this is a primarily professional opportunity and you should not shirk your professional um, and educational responsibilities, um, but you should also use this as an opportunity to invest in yourself and your interests. Um, in many cases, you'll be coming off of four very long and stressful years as an undergraduate. This is a great opportunity for you to cultivate relationships, learn new skills you haven't been permitting yourself to explore in the past, um, and to begin thinking about yourself once again as a whole person rather than just as a student or as an employee. Um, so those are my kind of you know takeaways from Fulbright. Absolutely, I would do it again. Um, you know, even if I knew you know from the beginning that I would be kicked out after six months because of COVID, um, it's a really really fruitful experience. I think of it very fondly, um, and I hope that you all decide to apply. Great, thank you so much. Not going away picture thing. Um, change of pace. We've got uh, Alex Metzler. Uh, and Alex, are you here today? Yes. Can you oh, hear good. Me? I can. Okay. Good. So, welcome. Good to see you again. Nice to see you as well. It's been a while. Okay, so this is it's an interesting to put these slides together because I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a professor at Syracuse University in Hamilton College, so I'm used to making these really professional slides. But here's some pictures of me and my cat, um, <laughs> France, uh, my parents in France. So I studied in France. Um, I'm an arts applicant. I was a doctoral student at the time that I applied. Um, so obviously, I've finished my doctorate now, and I am teaching. Um, I went to France to study the pipe organ. 
um, as well as uh, doing some research on secularism in the organ. Uh, France has a highly secular population, although it identifies as Catholic, um, and, and trying to figure out new ways for the organ, uh, an instrument associated with uh, Christian churches primarily, to function in a society that um, at least Europe and, and um, North America has highly secularized. Um, so I th uh, one of the reasons I put this uh, first picture up is I wanted to say you can bring your animal to some of the countries. I have a cat and he's one of my best friends and I was really, really worried about that. So I just wanted, if anyone was thinking about that in the back of their minds, if you have a cat or a dog, um, obviously you have to work within the confines of um, whatever laws there are for animal um, things. But I'm happy to talk about that process. Um, uh, yeah, if you could just go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, so I was living and working in Versailles, um, uh, and uh, some of my projects involved um, just playing, which is what musicians do best uh, with not talking. Um, so uh, some of my outreach involved uh, doing recitals um, around uh, the Versailles area and Paris and some other places. Um, and um, sharing American music, sharing French music, um, exploring uh, secularization that way. Um, so we had some really amazing opportunities to visit. Um, uh, the, the picture on the left is at the American Cathedral where we gave a recital for the Fulbright uh, Commission folks. So all of the researchers, biologists and, and scientists all came to hear um, an organ recital, which is really wild. And believe it or not, there were two of us there that year. Um, uh, the other um, woman was from the uh, Catholic University of America in Washington. Um, and then uh, the picture uh, center bottom towards the right is uh, Radio France, which is in Paris. It's like one of the most prestigious concert halls in France. And because of that, it's also one of the most prestigious concert halls in the world. Um, and we're just in there just on a Tuesday afternoon, just playing the organ, just chilling, which is really uh, wonderful. And then I just had to share the, the bottom left side there uh, is a picture of uh, a very fancy French guy taking out his trash, which was just like this very cute thing that was on my trash bin and I could never get over how cute it was. <laughs> um, so a really, really wonderful experience um, doing research and studying the organ. So I did enroll at the Conservatory in Versailles um, while I was there and did actually obtain what's the equivalent of like an artist uh, diploma in the US. So I did get, it's not really a degree in the, in the way that we think of it, but um, it did have a conclusion to it. Um, and if I could just give one piece of advice, my piece of advice would be to use the resources at Arizona State uh, to the best of your ability. Oh my gosh, the resources at Arizona State are so good. Uh, working at some institutions that have great Fulbright programs, but oh my gosh, uh, everyone was so responsive and so kind and um, the feedback could be brutal sometimes either from faculty or elsewhere but just so beneficial that i just think um i owe asu a great deal for for having succeeded in this yeah okay thank you you know and and alex is a great example i use his application quite often because you know the first thing you have to explain is why do i have to go to this country well the answer for him was quite simple organs don't move and so if you want to use the organs, you have to go to France. But um, Alex, I was wondering, what was your language proficiency at the time you went and how did it, how did you get it to that level? Um, so I dedicated a great deal. I knew for a while that I wanted to go to France. Um, so I had dedicated time to auditing courses at ASU. Um, so you have to deal with that on program by program, whether they let you do that or not. But I also um, uh, became very close friends with somebody who spoke French and did private tutoring. So I would meet with somebody twice a week. And so by the time I went to go get evaluated by an Arizona faculty uh, member, I had met them, I knew them well, and I walked in and we just spoke in French and she goes, yep, you're proficient. Um, so I had a very high proficiency, but that was due to ASU's resources. I worked very hard on that. So, you know, that, that is one for those of you that are thinking, well, I, I speak, I got one year of Spanish under my belt. There are, there are alternative ways to get your language proficiency up to the level it needs to be, um, both either by the time you apply or by the time your grant period actually starts. And as a doctoral student, I had zero time to take classes, but the, the resources are still there. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. And Abby. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me.
And I am today going to talk about uh, Taiwan and my ETA grant there. Um, I'm actually currently still in Taiwan, so it's a little early for me, but I'm going to try not to yawn during this presentation. You can go to the next slide. Um, so there's a couple of things that I want to talk about, and you can kind of flip through um, this, but uh, a big part of my experience here in Taiwan has been the community element of it. Um, and right off the bat in Taiwan, you have this awesome ETA and ETF uh, community. And I'll talk about ETF a little later. It's an extension program that they offer here in Taiwan. Um, I believe that Taiwan Fulbright has the one of the largest um, ETA programs. They have 135 ETAs, 70 ETFs, and that number is constantly growing. So. When I first got to Taiwan in 2021, January, um, this was an awesome community for me just right off the bat. Um, when you're navigating social differences and cultural differences, um, you do just automatically have this community to fall back on. This in the top left corner is my cohort in Elon, where I lived um, my first year. And just, they are still some of my closest friends. Um, following that is the the in right below it, I'm going to kind of go left to right. Um, the LET community, the local English teachers, um, this they were incredibly beneficial in helping me navigate, you know, learning how to how to join the community. And um, they just really they were awesome throughout the whole experience. And I'm still I'm going to get lunch with my LET in a couple weeks and I'm excited to see her. Um, so still awesome elements of community. Of course, the students are incredible. And one thing that I really loved about my time as an ETA was that because this is also, um, this program in Taiwan has been established for a long time. Um, these are mostly very experienced local English teachers that are used to having an ETA and are really awesome mentors in that way. So I got to bring a lot of my personal interests into the classroom when I taught. This was an English club that I got to talk about Earth Day and sustainability, which was um, part of my degree here at ASU. And uh, I think that really got me very engaged. I'm, I don't have a teaching background. I'm not a teacher at all, um, but that was a really awesome way for me to continue learning. Um, following that is the local community and the local friends that I've made, which I would say is probably just an amazing part of um, Taiwan is that everyone is so friendly and awesome. Um, there's a lot of ways to find local friends, whether you're doing a language exchange um, or finding an interest group. I'm a, I really like to bike, and so I found a lot of awesome friends through biking, um, and those are still some of my closest friends. This slide is more talking about um, the versatility, I think is the word I'm going with, for, of Taiwan and the ETE program here. You really have so many options to choose in what environment you want to be living and working in. Um, there are 13 counties in Taiwan and Fulbright is in nine of them. So if you want to be in a more rural area or you want to be in a city or in the mountains or by the ocean or on an island, you really have a lot of options um, and can kind of find the environment that you're looking for. Um, for example, my first year I lived in Ilan, which is a more rural area on the east coast of Taiwan. And those are, I just got to experience so much of the natural beauty of Taiwan. Um, they have incredible hiking, biking, surfing, rock climbing, anything you can imagine. I'm from Colorado and I'm, I'm constantly amazed, uh, even more so by the, the beautiful landscapes here in Taiwan. Um, this picture on the top left was a, uh, this last Lunar New Year holiday, I got to bike around the island um, about 650 miles. And I there was not a moment in that time that I was not just in awe at how beautiful, beautiful this island is. Um, and then on the flip side, they also have some awesome cities and um, that type of lifestyle if you're interested. Now I live in Taichung, which is the third largest city in Taiwan. So. You can have the, the, the clubs and the night markets and the bars and the restaurants and, and that type of culture. Um, and the kicker is that 
even if you are in a more rural area or you live in a city, everything is so accessible. Um, the public transportation allows you to get anywhere on the island in a weekend. So especially lately, I think there hasn't been a weekend that I haven't been traveling, whether to get into some nature or go to another city to explore. So uh, it's, it's really versatile is the word I'll go with. Um, then in this top right corner, I would just encourage anyone that's interested to look into the history of Taiwan. It is incredibly interesting. This is me at the National Palace Museum in Taipei. Um, and just the culture and the history that has come from this island is incredible. And I feel like I've been here for a while now and I've still only scratched the surface. So I recommend anybody should look into it. Um, then a really cool part about the Taiwan Fulbright program um, and following afterwards is there's a lot of opportunities to stay um, beyond your year. So I briefly mentioned earlier the ETF program, which is in um, Taiwan, which is an extension of the ETA program. A lot of my friends, I'd say the majority of my, the people that I met in as ETAs last year have stayed and are continuing to teach this year as an ETF in Taipei, in Taiwan. Um, and you can continue to do that for multiple years um, if you want. If I want to go back and teach, then I'm able to do that too, which is really cool. Um, so if you're looking to be somewhere and maybe stay a little bit longer, then there's a lot of opportunities for that. I, like I said, I'm not a teacher um, and I wanted to pursue something a little different. So right now I'm working and studying at uh, Donghai University, which is in a university here in Taichung. There's a lot of opportunities to do stuff like that where you get to study Chinese or study other things and work. And um, so I would say Taiwan is an awesome place for maybe seeking further stay. Um, I'm definitely happy that I'm still here. And uh, they, I, have, I threw my email on the slide, so feel free to reach out if anybody has questions. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I have to yeah. say. Great, thank you so much. And lastly, Rebecca Spice, who uh, went to Germany and you saw a little bit of her earlier. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, I was also a 2019-2020 Fulbrighter. So uh, it was a little bit cut short uh, because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it was my first time ever writing a grant proposal. Um, I wrote mine for journalism. Uh, that's what I studied in undergrad. And um, because I grew up in Switzerland, I already had language profici proficiency in German. Um, and those were the two biggest factors was that it was my area of interest and I already had the language um, proficiency, but I'd never written a grant proposal. So by the time I got to, um, by the time I got to like the dress rehearsal, uh, my proposal was way out of my league. I wasn't sure what I was doing. I got feedback saying, you know, rethink this, which was excellent feedback. Um, so I'm very uh, happy that the honest office, you know, I came very close to not submitting my application at all. Um, but, you know, the application requirements are not a secret. They're out there. You can research them and you can objectively look at where your strengths lie. So instead, um, I changed my grant proposal. I had been reporting on immigration. Germany was going through some very interesting immigration um, from Syria. Um, so that's what I tailored my proposal to. Um, and for grant proposals, I my biggest tip is that it's a proposal. There were a few people who got to the country where, you know, unforeseen circumstances, someone was working in a lab um, that closed. The woman I wanted to work with, um, my journalism mentor, she switched uh, beats to only write about China before I got there. So the proposal, you can uh, you can tailor it to, you, you kind of build a rosy, like this is the best case scenario. Everything is going smoothly. This is exactly what's gonna happen. But they're, they understand that you're not someone who could predict the future and no one is gonna hold you you know, hostage if you don't manage to hit every single um, point on your proposal. Uh, so what I did when I was there, since my work um, was not in a school, I found a community center to tutor um, and uh, basically other volunteers that you find abroad. They're generally wonderful people. Um, so that was really helpful because um, you do have a lot of free time. So one of the highs of the experience was um, 
I, uh, I got an unexpected assignment uh, to cover a shooting, which is, which is it's kind of sad to say it's a high, um, but in the journalism world, it was breaking news and I happened to be, uh, I happened to be where they needed me to be. So uh, I got to cover a shooting for a wire service, which was um, very helpful in making contacts. Uh, then Lowe's were sort of being unsure of myself. A lot of people are kind of stressed. You think that after you get the grant, like the hard part is over, but you have to move to a whole other country and it's stressful and it's okay to be stressed about it. Um, then there were a lot, of, a lot of people who I met, especially people from, you know, like state schools. This was the first like name brand shiny thing I'd done. Um, and so a lot of other students were like, I don't know why they picked me. I'm not sure if I'm right here. It's really normal to feel that way. The Fulbright, you know, they trust you. They picked you for a reason. They saw your resume and they saw that you have drive, motivation, and a lot of other things that you probably showcase to them. So it's okay to enjoy your free time as well and uh, stop feeling like an imposter. No, <laughs> um, but understand that the committee is generally good at picking people who um, who will do well on this program. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are in the journalism field, but it's kind of um, a terrifying industry. You have to walk sort of a fine line between constant rejection because that's sort of a universal experience, but also keeping an objective eye on why those rejections might be happening. And I think the best way to do that is to read other journalists work. So you can see what good work looks like, what where um, you kind of need to bolster uh, what you're doing. Because as a freelancer, you're not gonna get a lot of feedback. That's what a lot of other journalists did was freelancing. Um, and some rejections are going to be really hard um, just because you're going to get through certain hoops and eventually get ghosted. Um, so I applied for a Deutsche Welle um, internship, which is uh, Germany's largest broadcaster. I was told I was in uh, the final selection pool and they wanted to give me personalized feedback on my application. And then they never returned my emails again. So certain, certain rejections are gonna happen like that. They feel more personal um, and they feel a lot worse. But my advice is, you know, keep an objective view of your strengths and apply again. Most places won't accept your first application, especially with internship applications. Being rejected once is not an issue. All right, thanks. Sorry. Oh, no, it's <laughs> I, was, I wasn't trying to brush you off the stage. I just inadvertently oh. clicked a button, so. But the excellent advice, Rebecca. Um, and yeah, um, the, the journalism award that Rebecca's mentioning is actually one of those specialized awards that Germany offers, um, you know, and that's only available in Germany. So it behooves you once you, um, you know, start narrowing down potential countries. And you know, like in Rebecca's case, I speak German. Maybe I should look at a German speaking country and then discover that there's awards that, that meet your specific career goals. Other people to say, well, I'm fascinated. You know, I, I'm, I'll confess, I like Game of Thrones. And so I'm gonna look at Croatia. Don't put that in the application, but you know, whatever, whatever your starting point is, is sufficient because this is a very large process and we just need to start narrowing down whatever we can. So we do have a couple of minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask the panelists or myself, um, I'm happy to stick around a little bit past our designated time to answer additional questions as well. Um, again, one of the best things you can do is jump into these boot camps that start this week or next. Uh, we would love to see you in one of those. If you can't make it, great. We'll see you in an advising appointment. And great question in the chat was, hey, if we have questions or I think of something later, what do I do? Um, you can book an appointment through our website, or if you just want a question answer, just email the general ANSA email address, and we can direct that to the right person to give you the best answer. So let me uh, stop there, and we'll talk um, and offer you an opportunity to ask as many questions as you'd like. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm assuming that our panelists would be fine with me sharing uh, their contact information. And I'll be sending a follow up email to everyone who registered for this event. So you can have access to this recording and some other materials. Uh, but yeah, they're, I'm sure they're going to put it up in, in the chat. But I'm, and I know they would be happy uh, to answer whatever questions you have. The one thing I've learned about Fulbright, and the one thing that's absolutely true and does not depend, is that they never pick jerks for Fulbright. 
Um, every person, <laughs> every Fulbrighter I've ever worked with has just been a really wonderful person that's happy to help and happy to talk about their experience and happy to help other people do it. So, good. Other questions? Yeah, good question. I saw, I did see a couple of questions about um, timing, right? So maybe you're you're a younger student. Would it make sense to get started now? That depends on what you mean by getting started. Like you wouldn't want to open an application and get into the canvas, right? That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but you know, if you think you might apply down the road in a future cycle, certainly it's a good time to start the advising relationship with us. Um, the boot camp. Um, you know, is intended for this year's applicants, but not everyone who starts will apply this year. Maybe they'll decide to apply uh, in a future year, right? Uh, but that's the intention. And in terms of what the boot camps are going to cover, you know, in, in one session, we're going to focus on how to get through the Fulbright site. And then we're going to talk about strategies for how to choose a country, uh, good strategies for how to choose a grant type. One of the things I love about Fulbright is that a lot of the, the odds of success are really in your hands on the basis of the decisions that you make. Uh, if you insist on applying for the UK Fulbright Award to the London School of Economics, and I tell you it's a less than 1% chance of success and you persist, then that's a choice that you made, whereas other countries might have a 20 to 25% selection rate. So. Um, We'll talk about that in the boot camp. We'll also talk about how to work with people to get good letters of recommendation, and we'll round out by getting you started uh, on strategies and how to get, get going on the essays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely basics of how to navigate the site, the grant type, the application, um, and decoding the application, things like that. Would we have better chances by applying to a country with, with more grant availability? Um, Yes, I mean, one of the things that you, you can find on the Fulbright site, we'll explore in the boot camp, but you can find it yourself is in the footer of the Fulbright site, there's actually a link for statistics. They hide that on purpose because they don't want people starting by looking at the statistics, but you can actually pull up all the application data from the last three years to see for each country and type of award, how many applications were made and how many grants were awarded. Some countries, um, you know, as Abby mentioned, Taiwan is a, is a very large grant pool, 100 and I don't know what they're going to be this year. We'll find out tomorrow, but probably 150 to 180 Fulbright applications just for that one country, whereas another country would have only two. And so that does determine exactly how competitive that country is. Can I add to that, Kyle? Yes, please. I just wanted to say yes, but if, yep. you, if you have a story that sends you, I have a lot of French experience and a lot of my research had to do with France, it, I had looked at Germany and I go, what am I, I'm trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, I don't speak German, even though there's some interest there. And my story really brought me to the country. Yeah. Absolutely. 100% yes. Um, we have had many applicants that have applied to very competitive countries. France is very competitive because Americans love to go to France for some reason. Um, but if that's the most sensible, feasible choice based on what you've done before and what you want to do in the future, then that's the way we'll go. And we're going to make sure that you send off the most competitive application. And yes, we do win. Uh, we've actually done pretty well in France. We've had one, two, three. I can think of four, five, four winners in the last uh, five years. Yep. Uh, can you apply? Yeah, great question. We probably should have covered that at the front. You're applying to one country, one type of grant per year. So you. this is why, again, we, we're putting so much emphasis on uh, the initial decisions that you make of what country and what type of grant. Um, and so if you're not really sure, that's a conversation that we have in the beginning. Uh, we have many applicants who start off working on one country and switch or start off on a study research application and then switch to ETA uh, or just, you know, um, turn the whole application upside down along the way. That's what the process is for, right? You don't have to get it right, right off the, the bat, but you do have to choose one country and one grant type per year. Yeah, so there are a lot of new awards out there. One of the, the participants was asking about a lot of the new awards out there. If it says new, then there aren't any previous recipients, right? And tomorrow, the Fulbright app, the website will refresh. And so um, new awards will pop up there. The ones that are currently marked new will no longer be marked new. Um, you can actually access a grantee directory on the Fulbright site as well. So if you look under the alumni tab, you can search by uh, type of country, uh, or excuse me, the name of country, type of award, or even you can just narrow it down just to ASU students and see what students um, have, have won that award in the past and track them down quite easily. So yeah, Carolina, you were, you were gonna add. 
Uh, yeah, not add, just uh, note that there was a, a question by Courtney Raymond uh, a little further up that I think we might have missed that I'm also happy to respond to. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, so is it advisable to discuss things like disability or LGBT involvement in your essay? Um, so I would say that when Fulbright says that it values diversity, I, I think my impression is that it very much values diversity in multiple senses of the word. Um, and I think that there's very much a case to be made that your involvement with these communities positions you in a positive way to immerse yourself in a multicultural environment. So when you're thinking about you know, the diversity of experiences that you bring to Fulbright and to your host country, it doesn't necessarily have to be strictly multilingual or multicultural diversity. It can be kind of a range of diverse experiences that position you to um, have positive relationships and uh, you know, uphold that spirit of, of mutual exchange in your host environment. So I would say that if, if that is very important to you and, and you think that's very important for you to um, communicate in your essay, then absolutely, I think uh, most of us would encourage you to, to do that. Right. I will add to that, and it can get complicated depending on the country that you've selected, that we understand that um, cultural attitudes, laws, mores um, are not universal. And so we do have to be respectful of our host country. And so some projects might be seen as highly controversial or some identities might be seen as highly controversial. Um, and that's something we need to work through. Does that mean you need to hide who you are? Absolutely not. But we do need to think about feasibility. Um, and is the host country even going to select you? And would you be safe? Um, so this is all part of the adaptability and flexibility, but absolutely, Caroline is 100% right that Fulbright is thoroughly committed to uh, diversity in all ways, shapes, and forms. Uh, we are at the end of our scheduled time, but I'm, I'm, I am happy and willing to stick around and answer, continue to answer questions. Um, our panelists are certainly excused if they have somewhere they need to be, but they're also very welcome if they'd like to stay and continue to answer questions as well. Um, let's see, another question. Uh, age restrictions. No, there's no maximum age for Fulbright at all. Some countries will specify a desire to have younger applicants or um, some will actually say they want somebody right out of undergrad and they don't want a graduate student. So it's important, again, to read those countries. But generally speaking, no, no restrictions of any course. Um, Marina asked a good question and maybe our uh, alumni would have an opinion. Is it better to make a proposal that is closely related to the field of study in your graduate degree field, or is a community project equally valued in the application process? That's a very difficult question to answer hypothetically, right? We would have to work through the specifics. Um, I will say though, if you're going to do a study research application, it has to have very concrete objectives and a very concrete connection to your professional trajectory. Um, if it seems like the majority of it is focused on your community engagement ideas, um, maybe you know, you're not emphasizing the right things. And maybe an ETA application would be better, which does really focus quite, quite heavily on your community engagement. But yeah, that, that's kind of a well, it depends question. Yeah, the, the boot camp sessions will not be recorded because they are uh, participatory. So there, you know, there's going to be breakout sessions and things like that. So we're going to be doing stuff. So no, if you can't make the boot camp sessions, that's fine. Um, we can do all of this work, of course, in individual advising as well. Uh, Katie, can you think of maybe who is our our most senior Fulbright recipient? And I know we've had some applicants that were at. Um, maybe the third or fourth act of life in their career and, and had come back to school and applied for Fulbright. It's not uncommon. Yeah, it, it is very common. I think um, it just depends obviously on your career trajectory. I think that's the biggest thing that they um, consider. And then uh, when I'm, I'm working with students or applicants as well, sometimes um, the country they choose is largely um, dependent on dependent support. So. Right. Um, if, or if they allow your pets, <laughs> you know, there's like a lot of factors to consider right. as well. Yeah, feasibility, feasibility, feasibility. Uh, Tanya asked about conflicts with accepting other awards or funding. That's a well depends kind of award, but you know, there, there is a section on the application where they ask you to, to summarize your other funding sources, whether it's personal finances or others. Um, if it's an award where you literally can't be in two places at once, then yeah, you've got to decline one or, or defer one. Um, uh, good question. Can you apply for a study program, not research, and include a community project? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but it, you know, 
it needs to be clear in the proposal what your engagement with that community is, whether that's explicitly part of your project with a capital P, or if it's something that you address as extracurricular, either way is fine. Yeah, Anusha asked, when do decisions come out? Great question. Now, uh, we're behind on reporting. They, they promised to have everything done by April 1st, and it's not going to happen. <laughs> Right. Uh, but generally, March through April is when all the, the board announcements are happening. So we're in the middle of it. So yeah, I don't uh, if um, announcements do vary by country, because again, the final selection is done by the coast country itself, and they they do things in their own time. So, so to recap, if anyone joined us late, you know, the way to get started in the application process is to you know visit Fulbright.asu.edu. That'll walk you through. Uh, the basic steps, there's some really good uh, TikTok length videos there, uh, explore some country options, and then when you have some specific questions and you're ready to formally get started, uh, schedule a meeting with one of us. If you can attend the boot camps, great, wonderful way to get started. If you can't attend the boot camps, also fine, uh, you'd be working with us along the way. So wonderful. Well, alumni, thank you so much, uh, those of you that didn't have to hop off because you have other things. Um, and. Uh, everyone else look forward to working with you and answering questions. Uh, sorry, a couple of questions popped up real quick. Dollar amount varies by country. You know, some countries are more expensive living than others. Uh, if we apply this year, what school you're, we're looking at, generally speaking, 23, 24 academic year. Um, some countries in the Southern Hemisphere, other places begin their academic year in the winter. However, keep that in mind. So thank you, everybody, for your attending. And again, we'll follow up via email with everyone. Um, but again, I, I can't express my gratitude for everyone's help today. So thank you all very much. Have a great one.